Thank you. So this morning uh, here we are looking at coaching the coaches and referees and a big thank you uh, to PGMOL for supporting this session. Uh, I've got with me today Kelly Lindsay, Head of Performance from Lewes FC, Lucy Pearson, the Director of FA Education from the FA, Katie Rawson, UEFA, UEFA A Licensed Coach, Bibi Steinhouse Webb, PGMOL Director of the Select Group Women's Professional Game. Gosh, that's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> and Annie Zaidi, uh, a WIF Ambassador and Coach. And of course, I'm Sue Bridgewater, University of Liverpool, and I also work with coaches and managers uh, thanks to running the course for the diploma for the League Managers Association. Can I just go round and ask you to briefly introduce yourselves to us? Tell us what it is you do, what your role involves in football. Kelly. What does the role involve in football? <laughs> Everything. No. Uh, so I'm Kelly. I, my background, real quick, is a little bit. I've, I've worked around the world. I grew up in America, played a bit on the US national team, coached in America in the college system, then the first or second professional women's league. And then I decided, what, why are we doing this? Because like many of you in women's sport, you get paid nothing. A lot of disrespect. Everyone asks me every day, what's your real job? What do you mean you work in football? What do you mean you're a coach? What's your real job? What do you really do? So I decided there must be more to this. There must be a bigger purpose like, than just grinding every day trying to win the next game. So I went on a little bit of an international tour and I really found my heart and my purpose and why I do what I do. And I've coached in Hong Kong and China and Afghanistan and Morocco and now here. And uh, I think that we have a big job to do to keep, get women in the game and keep women in the game. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Lucy. I'm the Director of Education at the FA, so um, I run the division that looks after all coach education, all safeguarding, all uh, scouting, talent ID, uh, medical support. We, have, um, we look up, try to look after around about 150,000 coaches in the game on any one particular day. Um, and over the last uh, three or four years, we've been trying to reach more coaches more often and diversify that coaching workforce. We are not done yet. We have a long way to go, but uh, that, that's the day job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm Katie Rosen. I'm with Everton Football Club as the technical director of the Women's Academy. I'm new to the role, new to the club. I've been in there 10 weeks. So to echo what <laughs> Kelly said, I'm doing everything. <laughs> um, and hopefully, that, um, hopefully I can steer and, uh, and build my own team so I don't have to do everything. Uh, but essentially, it's looking at um, developing that player pipeline. I used uh, Jill Scott as the uh, example yesterday as I've been a, a previous Everton player and said, actually, can we uh, support and develop as many potential Jill Scotts as possible? So that's where I'm right now, very busy. Glad to have a couple of days away to kind of zoom, <laughs> zoom out, get a bit of energy from everybody in the room and, uh, and take that back to Everton. Bibi. Good morning, I'm Bibi. I'm a former referee myself. I have been refereeing nationally and internationally, nationally in Germany. I have been in the men's second Bundesliga for 10 years and uh, had my, um, banged my head to the glass ceiling a lot of times because I had, a, I had a boss in charge who said like under my leadership women will not make it into the professional first Bundesliga. So I had to wait for a new boss, a new um, head of the federation, had to have 10 years of patience <laughs> to actually made it and <laughs> thank you. <laughs> But my job these days is I'm working with the officials in the women's professional game in England, and I don't want anybody to wait 10 years for their chance to perform. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent point, Annie. Um, good morning, my name is Annie. I wear many uh, football headscarves. I'm working towards my A license at the moment with a tier four club in Covent in the West Midlands. My day job is I'm a female um, engagement officer for the Barclays Strategic Lead to get more girls in schools equal access to play football across Leicestershire. Um, if I'm not watching football, I'm a big Arsenal fan. Had to put that in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
sort of my starter in terms of questions, just so you can see some of the journeys. We've heard a little bit there about journeys you've been on and how long it took to get to various roles and so on. But could you just tell us briefly, all of you, how you got started in the game? Where, where did this journey begin for you? Um, well, for me, I think at well, four years old, I started playing because my brother played. I was dragged out to the pitch and it looked like fun. He got, he got to run around in the mud and run into people. So that looked fun. Um, in grammar school, the key moment was when the teachers told us girls couldn't play at recess anymore. They couldn't play soccer. So I rallied all the boys and girls together. I said, listen, we can outsmart them and we're more, we're fitter than they are and they won't be able to keep up. So we had a kickball pitch way over there and we had a soccer pitch. And I said, when they come and blow their whistle, we're going to pick the ball up, we're going to run to the kickball pitch. We're going to continue to play. It's going to take them time to get over there. They're going to blow their whistle again. We're going to kick the ball and we're going to do this every moment and every day until they give up. Two weeks later, they totally gave up and girls could play forevermore. So um, <laughs> sometimes you just got to take charge. But I think my journey of coaching started at 13. I went into my first US national camp. I realized I came from a place where there was no coaching, like my dad coached me, there was nothing. And I just felt, holy cow, I just learned so much. Like, wow, this is cool. I need to take it back to my community. Mm. So at 13 years old, I started my own coaching school and my own coaching project in my community. And then it just has built from there into playing professionally and coaching and everything that went from there. Fantastic. Uh, so my radical statement is I'm not a footballer uh, by any stretch of the imagination. I'm far <laughs> too slow um, and I have really poor foot coordination. Um, so my, my sport is actually cricket. Um, that was my game, my similar experience with when I was a youngster about uh, watching a brother. That seemed to be a good game. Got my front teeth knocked out uh, in my first, uh, facing my first delivery. So picked a ball up and thought I want to be at the other end. Um, <laughs> so played for England for nine years, had that privilege. But actually, professionally, I've always worked. I've always been a teacher, English teacher, qualified. Uh, became a head teacher for eight years. Brilliant job. And then um, five years ago, decided I wanted a shift. Uh, quit being a head teacher. And a few months later, head of education came up at the FA. I am passionate about um, coaching, about young people, about inclusion, about women in sport. Uh, and I've been really privileged to be in this position and this role for the last four years, trying to make a difference for, for the game. Fantastic, thank you. Katie? Yes, similar. Um, Did I... you play cricket as well? We <laughs> 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 had a team going. <laughs> um, I, I remember it literally um, so vividly. It was, um, I was seven years old, we were on our way to go and get the Christmas tree uh, in the car with my dad and my sister and said to my dad, you know, he, he was going off uh, on a Saturday afternoon. So I said, where do you go every Saturday afternoon? I don't understand, you just disappear off, where do you go? And he said, oh, you know, and he tried to explain that he goes to a football match and he's a season ticket holder and that's why it happens, um, you know, every other Saturday. So I said, well, I, can I come? Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, so he took me along that afternoon, um, Nottingham Forest against QPR carried me in, I was seven, he carried me in pretending I was like younger so he could just carry me in the days where he, and then he just lit, carried me through the turnstile, sat me on his knee and it's like wow, there's like 30,000 people, we beat QPR 4-0, Nigel Clough scored a hat-trick, that was it, life decision right there at the age of seven, this is, this is it, this is going to be my life. So then I was a season ticket holder, you know, all the way through um, until my early 20s when I was then coaching. But the way I got into coaching is my access was then obviously watching it. So then, well, I, well, I want to play this. Well, but nobody else had a reference point. So I had to um, kind of bribe my friends and go, hey, we're going to play this game. But they didn't maybe know what I was talking about because they didn't have the access. So before you know it, I was trying to emulate, you know, Brian Clough because I was trying to tell them how to play the game because they had no reference point. And that's literally how I came into the coaching by bribing my friends, trying to teach them what the game of football was, um, trying to uh, persuade the PE teachers to lend us a football kit. Um, and then I would enter us into tournaments and we'd go around the region and, and play football tournaments and I would play and try and teach my friends who I'd bribed <laughs> uh, and, uh, and yeah and then we would play and that, that was my access to coaching so I guess yeah I was a coach from about the age of nine. <laughs> Phoebe, you told us a little bit there but where, where did you start? My dad was a referee <laughs> so um, I played 
with my friends and uh, knowing that my dad was out as a referee, like kind of, they, he convinced me to give it a try and to make a course and to go um, down that road. And actually, I have to say that was probably the best decision in my life. It's the skill set that refereeing brings to you is amazing. And especially for young people growing up, this is such a life school. Like learning the laws of the game, actually applying them, and dealing with immediate feedback <laughs> from various distances. <laughs> um, and communicating, communicating what you actually decide, like verbally and with your body language, out there on the green bit in front of 90,000. Like honestly, if yeah. you want to listen to a national anthem, that is the best <laughs> place to be. <laughs> so honestly, it, it, um, it couldn't get any better. And uh, how, ended, how did I end up here in England? Uh, one and a half season ago, like Kelly and I, we had a, we had a long conversation um, and she dragged me over the border. <laughs> Welcome Brexit. She's now we <laughs> that, that Kelly Simmons is very persuasive. Yeah. <laughs> she was, she was. And actually it's so exciting to talk about the future of the game and how it will evolve and shape. Yeah. And there is a place to actually for all women to make like a real career succession, a real journey in refereeing. So I take the playing part <laughs> and I take the coaching bit, but in between there's a referee journey. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and we'll come back to that one in just a moment. Uh, but Annie. Yeah, I did my level one, level two when I did my master's in youth and community work and I was like, that's something I wanted to go back in the community. But I didn't want to stay as a community coach. I wanted to change the narrative. And I, like, a bit like you, I just fell in love with technical detail. I'm a technical geek when it comes to how do you pass, how do you play, left foot, right foot. And I knew I had potential within, and that's why I carried on, did my B license in the foot. And I self-taught, so if I weren't studying it, I was watching, if I weren't watching, I had books and books, and watching, going to games, National League games and on my own watching games, studying it, analysing it, and that's where you pick up the knowledge and you pick up more fascination. And, and that's why I realised this is what I'm going to do full-time now. Because I have got ability, I've got the potential, but I just need to just carry on until the time's right. And I think, yeah, my mum says she's got the fourth, fourth son that she never had. As a three brothers, I'm the only person in the house got washed the bibs, got football in the boots, and yeah, she's not happy, but it's all right. <laughs> I know, that moment, that moment when my mother realised I was going to be a football fan like my dad. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're all involved in some way with, with coaching, with refereeing and so on, but what are we doing to try to uh, support more women to become coaches and referees? And this is probably mainly to Lucy and to Bibi, but what are we doing to help more women to come into coaching and refereeing? Um, well, when you look at the whole gambit, it's, it, there's a lot going on that the FA does. Um, and if I look at um, getting people to, females to step over that sideline. So we have, when we think about the game, we think about the men's, the women's and the disability um, pathways. And we think about the senior game, we think about talent and we think about grassroots. So we have um, activity in all of those grid sections to try and encourage particularly females and coaches from historically underrepresented groups to step into the game. And I think this has been a tactical and significant tactical shift in this FA strategy period where the game has declared we want a game free of discrimination. Well, in order for that to happen, we have to have a workforce, we have to have um, a playing profile, we have to have teams that reflect the communities. So, there are many things we're doing. One thing that we have done is we have orientated our grassroots coach development workforce to be very specifically um, supporting those underrepresented groups. So there is a group of coach developers who work very specifically to promote females in the game. And that can be from working with um, communities that we haven't traditionally worked with to encourage uh, females from those communities to take a role in the game. We have created uh, the Playmaker. So one of the things when I first came here, as is, is everyone will know, there was the level one. If you had not had the experiences of playing the game, 
the level one kind of had a level of, of, of requirement of technical and tactical knowledge, which a lot of people who just think, I just want to help my five-year-old child play the game, mm. um, it was too much, and therefore they, they weren't stepping in. So the Playmakers and Online course is just, look, if you can organise, basically, a kid's party with 40 kids going feral and party bags, you, <laughs> you can totally coach. You know, it's not that difficult. So I think we needed to break down some of the barriers of, I haven't got the technicals. You don't need technical skills. Yeah. You know, need to, to, to let children play, let them play safely, and let them have a brilliant time, because they will then do everything else themselves. Mm -hmm. Because the coach is a facilitator at that, at that level. It's just to put that on. So there's, th th that's part of what we're doing. Uh, we also then have um, fully funded places are available across all our grassroots courses um, for females and for coaches from historically underrepresented groups. Um, we have a series of coach developers who are working in the talent pathway through the Women's High Performance Centres. Uh, we have an, a number of coach developers for the Women's Senior Game. Uh, we have bursaries for the license. So there is an awful lot that is going on. I mean, I could spend uh, hours trying to justify it, <laughs> that, but I would, quite the list. I yeah. would like to call out Audrey, who's here, because um, um, Audrey Cooper, who, who uh, was here when I first arrived, I think was a, was a single voice yeah. in this environment. And, and we talked, Audrey, a number of times about kind of she had to sort of plow, make some furrows, plow into that. And I think we're just beginning to see the seedlings and, and, the, and the positivity. The answer is we have a lot more to do, uh, but what we've done is we are dedicating an increasing amount of resource to, to this space. Okay. Which is excellent to hear. Baby, is it the same or different for referees? What's happening in that space? Just really to add on on those, when we talked about the Lioness's success just behind us half a year ago, where Kelly said like she couldn't wait for the final whistle. I was be I was there. She screamed at the referee <laughs> to blow the final whistle. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the lionesses has been uh, they have been amazing. The success was brilliant, and the vibe in the country was just like goosebumps all over. Right when you could see like all the jerseys where you expect I expected to be like Kane or something else like on on the back. <laughs> But it wasn't, it was Millie Bright and it was like Greenwood and it was like all the female names, which was so inspiring really. And we not only have amazing players on the field of play, we have also referees involved in those international tournaments. And if we're talking about the Women's World Cup coming up in Australia and New Zealand, we have three representatives over there with Rebecca Welch, Natalie Aspinall and Sean Messielis. So there are different opportunities to be involved in those major competitions. And if you are aiming for the best, the highest standard internationally, then of course you look at a wider quantity to actually choose from and to make sure that the pipeline is going well. And what I actually, there are a lot of programs going on to get more female officials into the game as well. And we have, we had about like 2,400 now increased numbers, which is like, this is like a massive grow. That's amazing. Um, and actually like helping, understanding that, well, I'm not telling you anything new. Women hunt in packs, right? <laughs> so you go to events with your best friend going for a referee course, like go in teams, like get the teams more qualified and understanding about the laws of the game. You are, your strategies on the field will change, I promise you already, understanding what you, why you actually do things. And taking this forward when you have, like you play 11-11 in your training games and actually somebody then picking up and under, picking up the whistle and understanding how difficult it actually is to make those decisions within your friends. I have so many assistant coaches calling me like, Bibi, can you send a referee? I'm tired of getting all this shit from my teammates. <laughs> um, and this is actually like stepping into slowly, giving a, a different opportunity because like, let's be honest, not everybody will get a contract as a professional player. So think about options. Think about other solutions. Mm. And, well, I wasn't clearly successfully enough mm -hmm. to be a player. And, um, yeah, <laughs> made the best out of it. Mm -hmm. So, 
and this is really to all of you, any of you, um, what have been the biggest barriers? What do you see as being the biggest barriers to achieving these great things that we're talking about and to continuing to get more female coaches, uh, referees into the game? For me, it would be the recognition and acceptance as a coach from other coaches in the club. Okay. Um, being a female, but not only a female, but a female from, from a woman of colour, having a recognition and not be, oh, you've only in the role because you meet statistics. That narrative has to change. Mm -hmm. When I did my B, um, my, one of my mentors, Chris Lamb, said he gave me a chance to work at QPR, I just did some voluntary hours just to be in the game, be around players. And I was like, no. He was like, take it. I said, no. I said, take it. I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> For, um, and my rationale was, that club, as much as we, Anita said and um, Jackie mentioned it, yes, they're doing really great things, but they don't replicate the 92 clubs in the country. And for me, as a woman of colour, to be recognised for my ability as a bloody excellent coach, I need to go to a club that looks like other 92 clubs in the country. Mm. So me being me, with my feisty attitude, I sent that series in the West Midlands, and my Spanish Albion, that they contacted me, head of um, academy, Mark Harrison at that time. My God, he's a scary man. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went in there, had a meeting, did a plan, short term, long term, medium plan. So I didn't want to go turn up, rock up expecting. I wanted him to know how serious I was about the opportunity. And he was like, he never smiled, which was, you know, a bit scary. <laughs> um, and then he said, he took me off the whole season and I learnt amongst the YDP coaches, the under 18 coaches, just shadowed them, picked the cones up, did whatever I wanted, did, felt treated like the rest of the players. And I recognised that if I could last in a club that mimics the 92 clubs in the country, I will have no problem <coughs> going anywhere else in the club, other clubs. And then it had a snowball effect. The Mark Fogarty from um, Solihull Moors phoned me up to um, approach me for the head of women's uh, first team ladies coach National League. Um, as well as under 16 boys. So it became that I'm not that female coach, I'm that really good, excellent technical coach. Mm. And that's the narrative we need to change and we need to be accepted for. Don't bring me in for statistics, don't bring me in for the sake of it. Mm. Bring me in because mm. of my values mm. and what I bring to your, what benefit your club and your team. Absolutely. Mm. So uh, 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 people had similar barriers, different barriers, what kind of barriers? Who screamed at a referee? I oh, have. Yeah. <laughs> you all need to go on a referee course. If you think you can do better, I expect you to be out there and prove it. Because yeah. that's actually what we talked yeah. about earlier, yeah. the culture piece and how we actually work with each other. Nobody is going out there, like getting up in the morning with the thought of, oh yeah, today I do a big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so, actually, like getting this understanding yeah. for each yeah. other and knowing that we're like that we're working so hard. Honestly, the officials work so hard to be the best they can be, and I have a whole team with me today that are working with them on a regular basis. Vicky, sports science, <laughs> like she makes them run. Oh, believe me, she <laughs> makes them run. Beck Smith, ex-international New Zealand player, has been out here on this green <laughs> bit as well. Because we, we do our best to understand the tactical approach that you guys put on the field of play. Yeah. So like taking that into a wider perspective and always remember how difficult it actually is. When I, when I see seven, seven different replays and angles on my sofa, I think it's easy. <laughs> I know it's not. Yeah. So, and actually taking that into consideration, when you do comments, when you, when you give feedback, constant feedback, on, on the green bit as well, so to actually take that into consideration, and we said that earlier, we have this probably little time frame to keep our culture in the way we want it to be, and I don't want, with all respect, I worked with him a lot of times, um, you probably have a face now in your head working in the English game here in England uh, where it's like, come on, this is not the pictures we want. 
They, we, we don't want to advertise our game, like screaming at each other from, like, from a very short distance, which is like, we're spending so much money on mental health, but slagging each other off. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. So the culture piece is really, really important for me. And uh, this is probably one of the barriers why people do not pick up the whistle, why they think it's like, well, why should I do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is something we need to change. Yeah. And Katie, you've been on, you, you talked to me about Coventry United earlier on, and obviously in your new role, um, and, and what a journey that was with Coventry United and, and some of the stuff that was going on off, off the pitch. Oh. So what kind of barriers have you uh, come across? Have you come across barriers? Absolutely. I think within, within the women's game, I think the barriers are still there in terms of resource. Um, so even just being able to get a contract that has, that even looks like a contract, to be perfectly honest. Does it have um, parameters? Is it... Um, yeah, like I said, look like a look like a contract. I think from the first first point of view, um, is it um, financially worth it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I think from a resource point within the women's game, I think the resource and the um, and the finances around having a coaching contract and what that means. Yeah. I think in terms of um, the boys' game, I think the barrier is access. There is still, and it, you know, it happens across many sectors, but. You can't get in, you can't get access unless you've had experience. How do you get experience mm. if you can't get access? So I, I've definitely um, come across both of those barriers and, it's, and it is constant. You know, uh, every time you try and go for a new job or you're, you're, you're trying to apply for a new job, well, actually, what does the contract look like? What do you mean a contract? You're a coach. Go back to what you said earlier. What, well, what else do you do? You know, oh, well, you're going to come to us and be a coach, but surely you've got another job to go and pay your bills. And, you know, a lot, throughout my whole career, I've always, always, always had another job um, alongside football, even if my football role has been full time because it, I needed to have something that I can say, if the football doesn't work out, or because I haven't got a contract, or the contract isn't worth anything, actually I still need to be able to pay my bills. So I, I think there's different barriers in the men's game and the women's game. Unfortunately, I still think they're there. There is a, it's a big part, I believe, of my, my role now at Everton. I know we, I've got to build a team around me, but I need to make sure I do the due diligence behind to make sure that the contracts that we are offering, the opportunities that we are offering, are you know, uh, going out to a diverse audience, they're inclusive, but also we're giving access to, to, the, to the right people and that we're, we're looking to um, recruit almost properly, I guess, and making sure that we're, we're, we're not making the same mistakes that we've done previously. And that we wanna be inviting. We wanna be inviting to say, hey, come and join us and come and be part of the, the women's uh, player pathway. Can we talk? I think, I, Sorry, just like I say, I, I think the greatest barrier across or for females in football is default thinking. And what we've heard is kind of people just going back to a model that has existed for a long time about patterns of thinking about recruitment, who looks right, who's got the right qualification, what, what do we think? And, and if we can challenge default thinking, whether it is a default thinking in a mum that I talked about that because she hasn't got X, she couldn't possibly be, or it's default thinking in a club, which is, well, we've got a network, we kind of know who we want, we're not going to make a transparent recruitment process. Default thinking around, well, if you haven't got evidence that you've worked in this part of the game, you can't possibly write, you know, we, we, the, the women's game and the, and the people operating it have to think differently. It is not the same, it is different, and it can be so much better because of that. So it's having people in positions of influence who are saying, I'm not accepting the narrative that we've always had to accept. Mm. What we have to do is we have to be more courageous, we need to be more disruptive, and we need to create a new and different future for the game. Thank you, Lucy, because you've just led me brilliantly into what I was going to say to Kelly there, which is <laughs> lose FC, you know, uh, disruptors of, you know, how we actually do this and how we view it. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit, I mean, I, I think most people probably know this, but what has been going on in the club in terms of challenging that default thinking? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to barriers for women, let's just start with, let's be honest. Women in the world are second, third, and fourth class citizens. If you think you're a first class citizen, you're wrong. Your country doesn't believe that. 
The people around you don't believe that. The government doesn't believe that. You've been put in a position for your entire life to be second, third, and fourth class. That's why there's challenges in getting people into the game. That's why there's challenges for women to have jobs. That's why we're sitting in this room. That's why in 2023, this is a ridiculous conversation for us still to be having. So if you sit there and you hope that someone else is gonna change this, we have to change it. We're responsible and we're absolutely responsible because the reason there's challenges in the game is because we've also allowed it to happen. And that's one reason I am at Lewis FC, because absolutely we're gonna stop allowing it to happen. We're gonna do a real diligent recruitment process for people. We're gonna hunt for people who really can do something different in the game. Because what typically happens in recruitment, what typically happens is what everyone here said, oh, I know someone, I pick up the phone. You know what, BS, <laughs> BS. <laughs> so you know one person. How do you know they're the best person? And this is my thing, like working in Hong Kong, I just wanna put a perspective around this. We get CVs and we say, oh, yeah, that's the one. We could put anything on a CV. Anything can go on, I can make myself look so good on a CV. The first thing I do in any interview is spend 15 minutes where I ask them, what's your actual journey? What's your personal journey? Because anyone can coach football. Yeah. Football's easy. X's, O's, tactics, make up what you want. That's not actually what wins. That's not what develops human beings. That's not what takes the women's game. <laughs> X's and O's, and I can teach you that. I can teach you how to do an Excel spreadsheet. I can teach you how to manage your day. What's your journey? Where are your scars? Where are your traumas? Where are your wounds? Because if you haven't been on a life journey, how are you gonna coach? You have to take yourself on a life journey you have to be confident enough to stand as a referee, to stand as a coach, to be a woman on the sideline. Me, 43 years old, on the career that I've had, standing on the sideline of English football, U18 boys, two months ago, being harassed by 16-year-old boys in the crowd. <laughs> oh, lose, lose, losers, you have a woman coach. Ah. All the Ted Lasso comments, and you know what? <laughs> <laughs> all the American accents, all the good <laughs> And you know what? Why it's important? Why having a life journey before you get into coaching, the long coaching is important? Because on that day, our U18 boys and our male staff learn that day, holy cow, this is what women go through. This is not right. Our coach is really good, and she cares. She's the first coach that's ever cared about us. We were just dumped by our coach two weeks ago. And this person who's head of the club steps in and coaches us and shows up to training and puts in the dedication and gives us a second chance and fights for us and teaches us. We've learned more in two weeks than we had in 18 years of boys football. And now she's being abused? And to me, that's the most beautiful moment of being a woman in this sport when you've been on a journey. Because I didn't have to say anything. Mm. I just got to do my job and stand on the sideline and our boys suddenly played harder, fought harder. The head coach slash my assistant coach slash my 25 year old that I take on a journey, I'm taking him on a journey, was like, holy cow, they treat you like this? Yes, that's why you're important. You're the future, not me, you are the future. It's important you hear this. So us as women have to put ourselves out there to be abused, to be put through the wrong thing, but to stand strong and be the culture that we stand for in women's sports. Because with, by saying nothing, we're teaching everything. So what do we do at Lewis FC? We do it right. And honestly, I was just in with a WSL club, one of the top clubs in this country. And they asked me about our recruitment for our head manager. And when I told them it was a four month process and these were the phases and our coaches had to go through this tactical, they had to tell us a strategy, they had to look at the budget, they had to work on management. It was a joint process. They interviewed us, we interviewed them, and they were like, four months, that's way too long for us. And I said, and you'll get the wrong person. You will absolutely go hunt someone that has a CV. Mm -hmm. But a CV means nothing. And my last point to this is a CV for a woman is so different than a CV for a man. And in Hong Kong, a woman, to be able to coach 11 aside football, which means they can go on their B license, they can go on their A license. 11 aside football for a woman in Hong Kong, you have eight teams. <laughs> eight teams, eight opportunities. That means eight women get to coach 11 aside football. That means eight women get to continue their education. Eight women get to go on in their career. Eight. Men's side. 
We have U8, U9, U10, U11, U12, da 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 da. We have 20 teams in each league. We have five divisions. We Whose CV is going to look which way? I don't care about your CV. I care about your, human, your, your humanity and your scars and your wounds and what you're going to bring to the project. And that's why all of us in leadership and strategy need to think about the human being and the journey they've been on and the journey they're going to take our teams on in order to make sure that women's football never loses the value that it has. It has nothing to do with the license. That is a piece of the journey. It's a piece of paper. It has to do with the human that went on that journey and got that license and what they're doing with it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so what do we need to do jointly, collectively, between our different organizations? What needs to happen that will take us on some of the next steps? I, I think the game, uh, for the women's game, for me, because one, one of the challenges for um, any coach in the game is, is, is the concept of the badge hunting and the getting the qualification and that. And, and the, the, the men's and the boys' game regulates really heavily. It sets a set of standards around coaching and it's, it's basically all encapsulated in a level and a badge. It, 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 I, I've done a lot of exams. I've been on a lot of courses in my life. I, they haven't necessarily given me all the tools. They've made me think about some stuff, but they're not a sort of a rubber stamp that I can now do X. They're sort of saying, well, I've thought about these things, but actually it's practice, 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 and it's ongoing learning. Yeah. So I think one of the things is to, for the women's game to think about what does a really great coach really need to do and to have, uh, and is it best encapsulated in a B or an A, or an AYA, or a pro license, or is it that we need to begin to recognize that what we actually want is evidence of a coach who is constantly learning, who's constantly asking herself questions, is constantly being curious, is going to stuff all over the, way, all over the place. So, you know, I've, I've talked to Kay, I've talked to Kelly a bit about, be careful of what you regulate for, because you could end up creating a, a further hurdle for females. Because let's be clear, there are 150,000 active coaches I've got a workforce of, in total, 120. So if they're trying to look after 150,000 coaches and all those coaches suddenly say, we want the B license, we've got a problem. And the people who miss out will be females, most likely. So I think it's about thinking about what ongoing learning looks like for coaches, how, how we validate that, mm -hmm. and how then in recruitment, as you've so articulately put, you're not necessarily looking for a rubber stamp. It's the person, it's the skills, it's the attitude that they're, they're, they're going to bring. And I'm not saying that qualifications don't have value, but what we're trying to do in FA education a little bit is unbundle them a bit and say, look, we're all work, we're living in a world now where we pick a mix around what we learn and actually going on a course isn't always what we want to do. So can we begin to think creatively about how you get a B license or how you get an A license? And is it you had to, do, to be at this place on this day at this time, and if you weren't there, you can't possibly be a good coach. It's nonsense. Actually, what we want is a, is a real variety around. There's sometimes they'll be learning things which are remote. There'll be stuff that you can dial into. There'll be stuff you can look at after it's happened. There'll be, and we want to then maybe bundle up all of that and say, based on all of that you've done, you've reached the standard. Yeah. So we've got to reimagine the future. And I think adding into that from a, a club or an organization point of view, you've got to take um, both of those examples that you've both given and, and, and again, do that positive disruption and work with your club and go, who is it that we actually want? Mm. So we might be able to understand the human in front of us and the scars and the war wounds, but actually, do we know if that's right for us? Do we know that um, if we're going to, whether we say it's a B license or an A license, or we're going to unbundle that, but actually still, what do we want? What yeah. do we, who do we want in our club that are actually, you know, uh, walking the walk in terms of our, our culture and our values? And I think there's going to be a lot of, you need to, to do it right, you need a lot of time to even unravel that first and understand that first as your own organization before then you, you can then say, okay, right now, let's go through that process and to get the right person to fit that because you could go through that process but not actually know who you want in the first place. So there is a lot of work to do and it's about then influencing the decision makers at your organization to say, actually, this is really important and understand, try and influence and get them to understand why it's important, but to do that work 
you know, underneath that and, and, and who was involved in that process as well. Because again, whoever it is, it can't just be a one woman band like I feel like I am at the moment and just do that. Actually, that needs to be collective for a whole club or a whole organisation. On the back of that, I think this should be accountability. Grass at a ground level where we are with other coach, there's a few technical co directors at clubs at like WSL or the lower league in the tiers and the woman pyramid who jump ship from the boys academy to the girls academy because it's easy access to get them on the A-Lars, you know, and that limits female coaches' opportunities to go apply for those technical roles, those head coaching roles, because they've been taken because the qualification is needed. Mm. We haven't got it. The men have had it in the men's like, boys' academy, but because they wanted to pass and get on the A-Licence, they know if they got in the women's game, it's such a quick turnaround, and a lot of male coaches are abusing that system. And that's where we're getting lost and left behind. That's the two honest reality. A few of my friends who are coaches, experienced coaches like myself, are not getting a look in because the boys have come in, taken over, and then they've brought their friends along and there's old school network again. So we reinvented the wheel in the women's WSL Academy setup, similar to the boys' academy setup, and something's got to give. Otherwise, we're just going to go speak, the same narrative is going to be spoken five years down the line, yeah. and we're still going to be saying, having the same conversation. Yeah, we can like it or hate it, but like networking is important. 100%. And like an event like this today, like should give us the opportunity actually to to line up and um, and bring people on our journeys and let each other know what we are actually doing and where can we support each other and how can we actually help each other and where like can we put each other in the picture and. Um, I have been the only female on the field of play for years and years, and now I'm almost the only female in the board. <laughs> that is exciting as well. <laughs> um, but actually, under understanding the dynamics and and how you can work them is is majorly important as well. And I I, I can figure out a lot of things myself, but I I also need to know where can I gather information yeah. that actually help me in the decision making process, and like being being honest with each other and like sharing sharing our journeys and and let's be honest we can we can all look great on CVs and we can all <laughs> we can all like polish our egos, but the the question is like where do you learn from? You learn from your shortfalls. You learn where actually things go massively wrong. And it is painful to actually evaluate what went wrong and where have you taken like the wrong street, um, the wrong junction. But like these painful evaluation moments make you, make you actually so much better in the future. And having this trust to go through with somebody you trust and the opinion that you um, um, you treasure is like really really worthwhile. I think a big piece of this, the unbundling. I think the development of a female coach has been exactly the same as the men for so many years. But like, what actually is a female coach? What does that look like on the sideline? What does that sound like? And is do we know it? Do we understand it? Can we be it? I think a lot of female coaches still to this day, when they stand on the sideline in whatever country they're in, they mimic or monkey the men. Mm -hmm. It's the only way they fit in. Mm -hmm. So to really, when we take these women on a journey that they, under, they learn who they are and we can build confidence in that, because it's really important that the women's journey is the women's journey. Mm -hmm. We can dress the way we want. We can look professional the way we want. We can act the way we want. But still society tells us we can't. So the more of us that do it and the more we teach this in coach education, and coach education is really complicated because women have big responsibilities. We care a lot. That means we care about our family and our partners and our life outside of it, which means we can't just go spend a week at coach education for a lot of reasons in a lot of countries. Why does coach education need to be two days long or five days long or a whole day? Why can't coach education for women be very broken up in different ways so it's more accessible. I can do my job, I can go for two or three hours, I can really focus, and maybe it takes me a little longer, but my husband or my partner allows me to do it, my job allows me to do it, my kids allow me to do it. I don't feel like I'm a terrible parent or a mother or a carer. We have to take this. Our psychology as women is very different. A man will just go get his license. 
but a woman has to put a lot of things around that financially and decision and time away. So how do we think about a woman's life? And when I was technical director in Morocco for women, my whole mission was two things. Let's all, every single one of us, a room full of men, go personally invite every woman into the game. It's your responsibility, not mine. Go personally invite, because for how many decades have you not personally invited women into the game? So don't say, oh, women, it's okay, come in. And then we hold a course in, sorry, I don't know my, my uh, British geography. We hold a course in Edinburgh for women who live in Lewis because it's freaking impossible to go. But literally we say, where are the women? And let's actually go there and do it really, really local. So personally invite women in, in every aspect. Personally invite, care, mean it, and do it local. Make sure they can walk out of their house and access the opportunity to engage in coaching and administration teaching. It's our responsibility to make it local for them, not their responsibility to chase the dream 65 million miles away on a salary that doesn't help them. And I think that's the thing that we can all do in our local communities. Put it at the heart, the, the women at the heart, and make it centered around them and their lifestyle and, and their responsibilities. Kelly, you've just rounded it up way better than I possibly <laughs> could. So at that point, I'm actually going to go to the audience and ask if you have any questions for the panel. Just waiting for a microphone. It's coming. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking about like, learning experiences and where learning begins and how we can support ongoing education. Um, I think universities are getting better in, in their delivery of a PE and it not being restricted to six hours um, in their whole time of undergrad. Um, and my university, I went to St Mary's, particularly um, worked with Chelsea really, really closely and they put out a free um, programme where they can um, develop their coaches. Um, and I'm a, t a PE teacher myself and I, I qualified in 2014 and I took part in a FA level uh, teacher's award. And I, I didn't know if that was is still in existence, but I believe that encompassed a lot of level one learning. Um, and then along my teaching, I've had to outsource um, for a CPD and how to, to develop my uh, own coaching. Um, but also, and refereeing as well, because I think uh, as a teacher, you're kind of doing both and you have to be able to encompass that. So I'm thinking um, out loud, is there a, a way of, of creating an award that, uh, as you're learning that you develop all of those skills? So like. So, t so teachers, um, hopefully that will benefit from the government's new funding and can we put that money into investing in our, in our teachers and the people that are working with young people in schools to really ensure that that legacy is what, what it should be and, and have that um, opportunity for them to, 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 to develop their qualifications, um, if that makes sense, creating like a new pathway in a sense that, that to what's already there. So is that, is that around um, teachers explicitly? Um, yeah. Because th this, is a, this is a really interesting point, is that I often have to challenge in the FA is that when we talk about football, we're often look, thinking about it in the, through the lens of clubs. Yeah. A actually schools, and the FA is really busy in schools, but we don't think about schools. So you've got a huge workforce of, of teachers and individuals and exposure for young kids playing football. And we need to be clear about that. So. Um, you're absolutely right. And also, a lot of those teachers, it's not as if they have that life, and they don't happen to also have, be involved in this life, which is because they're, they're either parents or they're, they're, they're connected through whether they're PE teachers or others. So, um, in answer to your question, one is that we are um, about to start an HEI pilot to make sure that, certainly starting with the, what is the UA for C, but ultimately towards the A for B, would be able to be delivered within the HEI learning experience. So, a, a teacher, or someone doing a sports science degree or other will be able to come out as a qualified coach. Because one of our problems in this country is um, people almost come out of uni and we then have to try and qualify them almost in order then to do the thing, Absolutely. rather than saying, are they job ready? Yeah. Actually, m much, much earlier on. That is a seismic shift in how we're trying to think. Because one of our pressure points is we get thousands of people or hundreds of people who want to do that. And I'm like, and they want to do it now. And I'm like, for referees, for medics, and for coaches, what about if they're coming out of, of, of higher ed or they're doing it 22, 23, and they're ready to step into a role, they've got some stuff. However, they are gonna have to make sure they're coaching. We've gotta make sure that their learning experience is grounded in the reality 
of coaching week in, week out. It's space learning. You should, you know, really brilliant learning is about, I might either practice some stuff and then think about it and then go practice some more stuff. Or I, I, I hear about a theory, I look into it and I think, oh, I'm going to try that out and then I'm going to reflect on it. So this space learning is really important. Um, so we do continue to do the, the PES and all those other things. But absolutely, the intention is we want to be work. The game needs actually and has a brilliant opportunity, certainly around female coaches, to have them ready at source rather than 10 years later when they start to think about it. Okay. So I know there were lots of questions, but we've probably got time for one last quick question. Um, oh, 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 two very quick questions. On the end there first, please. <laughs> Hi. Um, absolutely um, agree with all the points because from my experience as a coach, manager, player, yeah. I've gone through all that, um, that experience and it's really great to see now with the Pro Game Academy coming into fruition, we've got ring fence funding for full-time roles, which is a long time coming. Kelly's obviously mm -hmm. knows that by myself, but um, going to the point in terms of boys' academy and criteria, so at the moment with obviously the influx of so many people wanting courses, I've got four females currently that's dying to get on the B and they can't get on the B within my environment, so that's a challenge in itself. And it goes back to, especially if you work in the pro academy uh, in, in, with the boys game, you have that influx of male coaches and that's something I've seen as well. Um, I'm cutting my license and thankfully I've got on that, uh, it was great. Um, I'm one of um, two females on a course of 50 of the year license. A majority of that is obviously again the boys academy piece, but it's that V criteria, they have to gain that to get criteria. So what are we gonna do and what are we gonna work through that to help support females? Um, there's obviously lots of space, I know for a fact, um, in terms of application stages, there's a lots of space where females can go into the courses, but how are we gonna manage that now in terms of numbers to increase that percentage onto the courses for females? Um, and more importantly, the right females as well and the right people for the right roles, because yeah. I think that's, you're right, that linear approach, you're going straight up and wanting to get the badges is, is that case as well. But I think the question is, is how are we going to create more opportunities for females and not just be criteria more about development? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I wish I could give you a really pat answer about this is going to fix it. Um, I think there's a few things to say around the, just the context around the B licence and indeed the A licence is that since the P in the men's game, Fundamentally, we talk about the women's game obviously exponentially changing and evolving because of the WSL and everything. The men's game and the academy space has also gone through a massive transformation, which is because of the salaries. So when they started out with the triple P, the, the, the workforce was relatively stable. And the notion was, well, there are this many jobs that require this many people with a B license. And if the FA therefore delivers this many per year, we will fix it. This world then shifted, which was actually, we're going to increase the number of coaches in the system. They're going to, a lot of those roles are suddenly going to become part-time because they're so poorly paid, people can't, and therefore there is then a spin. So it doesn't matter how many A licenses we put on, there aren't enough because the workforce is like this. It's like a swing door. So one of the things we're talking with Kelly and Audrey about is don't let, let, we've, got to, we've got to be really careful with the WSL and the Women's Championship where you require the B licenses is how are we gonna deliver that? And one of the things we're looking at, certainly in the men's game at the moment is, can those heads of coaching roles which have begun to emerge, can they become more deliverers perhaps in club around the coaching qualification? Now, coach delivery and coach education is an art, it's a skill. It's not, it's not something people say, well, I used to be a coach, so I must be able to educate everyone because actually I like to think the teaching profession might go, it takes a bit more than that to do that. <laughs> you know, I've done sort of four good years. Uh, but the problem is with education, everyone thinks they're an expert. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to copy what I did when I worked for me when I was a kid. I'm like, yeah, but these people are different. So we absolutely have um, um, that issue. We also, UEFA have also, we've also got to, we're at the moment, we're doing a talent and senior game review across the men's and women's space, across all of those quals to say, what is coming down the track? So UEFA um, are, have um, developed the UEFA uh, Youth B, and they've now got an Elite A. So I'm looking at this going, well, where does the, where does the youth be? So what, who is it who genuinely needs a B? It should be those who are working in the adult space of the game. And the youth B is actually for those who are working arguably in the academy space. So we could end up just splitting it. So you take the pressure off the B and actually youth B could deliver, be delivered in club. Same with the elite. Who really, who really needs it? What happens is that everybody, everybody needs this qual. Everybody needs that qual. I'm like, 
so one of the things we're doing is, is look, talking to the academies and to the UEFA to say, actually, if the youth B could come before, because at the moment they've got it placed after, I'm like, oh my God, you've just kind of created a new problem yeah. for us, which is the thousands of people who have B are now going to say, well, I need, I need youth B, here we come. It's a new, it's a new problem. It, we, would, we would reset a problem if we could get the, B, the, the, the youth B prior to B and say, look, there is a big difference between under 18 football and adult football. And that's what we've got to talk about. Not, well, the, the B is a fit for everyone. The A is a fit for everyone else. It's just not true. So, so the, the landscape is changing. And what we're trying to do at the moment is get, is get clear on what that landscape needs to look like. In answer to your question around how do we make sure that the right females and, well, females and then the right females are, are on those courses, that's something we're working on with our, our, our women's coach developers who are working in clubs, working with people, and we're looking to say to clubs, look, help us make sure the right people get onto the qualification. And even if they're not doing the B, what is the critical thing actually they need to be focused on to help them get a better, be a better coach? And that's what we need to do. I don't have an answer. I just, I'd love to say to you, oh, we'll put on a thousand more places and the problem goes away. I, I don't have the workforce. I just, I, you know, we, we just don't. So, but I think it is, if it's an issue you really feel very strongly about, please, please sort of get in touch with myself, with Mark Swales, with Dan Clements, who's the head of coach development. And let's have a conversation. Okay. So look, we could go on all day, couldn't we? We, we, could, we, can, we could sort all, lots of things or debate them and so on. But I'm being told that I've actually timed out. Mm -hmm. So um, if you've got questions, I know there were other questions, please come up and talk to us in the breaks or come up and talk after the sessions. Love to talk to you. But can I just thank our fantastic...